Today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast is Tom Skerritt. Tom is the co-founder and chief creative officer of Triple Squirrels, a Pacific Northwest lifestyle-focused media content provider. Tom has led a successful career as an actor, being a two-time Golden Globe nominee and Emmy Award winner for lead actor in a drama series. In a 60-year acting career, Tom has appeared in more than 40 films and over 200 television episodes, including roles in classics such as MASH, War Hunt, Alien, Steel Magnolias, Top Gun, A River Runs Through It, and Picket Fences. After Tom graduated high school, he enlisted in the U.S. Air Force, then continued to UCLA, where he began his storytelling and acting career. Originally from Detroit, Tom now resides in Seattle with his wife, Julie, who he co-founded Triple Squirrels with just prior to the COVID pandemic. In his free time, you can find Tom working on his memoir and two new screenplays. Welcome, Tom. I am beyond excited to have you on the podcast. Well, thank you for inviting me in to your beautiful looking place there. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, I'm going to hit you with some rapid fire. Are you ready? Sure. Okay, what's your favorite movie? It's a tough question. It is a tough one because I keep going back to Citizen One. Citizen Kane is the one that really just spawned all this when I was in college. And I saw that and I said, I want to write and work to that level. Yeah, it's a great movie. Yeah, um, I'm That's curious, tough. you know, given the pandemic, we've all been inside and now luckily we get to kind of uh, be outside and get back to the real world. But what have you read or listened to or watched over this past year or two that you find yourself kind of coming back to and recommending? Uh, you know, I don't watch much television to begin with. And with COVID, I was given some opportunity to really knuckle down and do these three different projects that I was, uh, have been working on. One, I think the imagine thing, imagination thing is over there on the shelf now. Uh, I have to go over it when I get more objective. But uh, as far as what I've seen, I, I love the film last year, for example, um, called the uh, uh, Truffle Hunters. Italian movie. Did you ever hear of that? I have not heard of it. Tell me it again. I'm going to write it down. The Truffle Hunters. The Truffle. Oh, I have heard of this. Yes. Yes, yes. I have heard of this. I've, my husband watched it, but I never watched it. He loved it. I've seen it over and over again. It's just genius. And nobody paid much attention to it in this country. But it's just a, a, basically a quasi-documentary. Uh, real people who work have worked for years learning how to be a good truffle hunter and their dogs that know where to go and yes it, it just i can't describe it it's and it, the exquisite photography cinematography of it yeah the composition the lighting is all natural and real i love it i'm writing myself a note i'm going to watch the truffle hunters i'm going on a plane tomorrow so i'm going to download it and then I'm going to rewatch Citizen Kane because I haven't watched that in years. So I'm excited. Okay. So I'm guessing, obviously, you already are a famous uh, everything. You're, you're like my most famous person I've had on the podcast, but I'm giving you other options that you get to be, you get to choose either a rock star or athlete or CEO or, um, you know, like novelist. Which would you choose? All of them. <laughs> the celebrity thing is not something I really, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not drawn to that part of uh, all of this stuff, all of this conversation, but what I have picked up from other people, uh, from the best of them back in the 60s and 70s, that I just happened to know before they became really famous. And they were really the people that taught me everything about how to, how to encompass a film how you make these things, how you put them all together with the crew and the cast and everybody that knows what they're doing in that room and that sound stage. Uh, so it's never anything one about it, just acting. The acting is moved by your outside influences. And I don't know if I'm answering your question because I go off on things like this. They're, they're all connected. Yeah. And it's hard to, to pick out on one thing or another. 
I really want, I'm a better director than I am an actor. And uh, but I've been, I have kids and grandchildren, even a great granddaughter. So those have been my first priority always. And um, yeah, your kids I, are, you've got four kids, right? Five. Five kids. kids. Yes. The last is uh, uh, adopted. Yeah. Oh, I did read that. Yeah. That's a lot of kids. How many grandkids do you have? Five. Five. Wow. Gorgeous granddaughter is all grown up now oh you have to send me after we hang up you have to send me pictures i i my my husband thinks i'm crazy because i just turned 50 and my kids are 12 15 and 17 and i keep saying i can't wait to be a grandma i just think it sounds really fun just to be like only spoil them and not worry about all the discipline and the kind of nagging stuff that comes with parenthood yeah. Well, mothers are something else again. I think women should be running the country and running businesses, you know, by and large. And I think you, you just take care of everything. Yeah, we do. It is absolutely you true. You know how to love, you know how to be, uh, you know, what the meaning of meaning is, you know, and uh, men with their egos, with our egos that we have, have continually have to allow that the women seem to put things together better better than you. <laughs> Not on all things, but yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that you recognize that as, as a man. And also generationally, right? Like you've been through so much in your lifetime of seeing women and equality and the growth of the women's movement. Um, so it's incredible. I'm sure that you've recognized that for years. So you're progressive. I don't think I've ever really been able to verbalize it. It's a lot of stuff that you have to feel first before you can describe it. It's like the paint, the Mona Lisa painting. Why is it so famous? And my theory is that it just has, a, she has a little smile or it's yeah. work. It's, yes. the, it's the mystery of everything that really draws us in. Those things we want to know about. Right. Best movies are that way. It's true. I'm I'm curious. I'm already sensing you have a lot of superpowers, but what have you been told consistently or what do you feel is your superpower? My wife. <laughs> Julie. No, your superpower. Like your ability to XYZ. Well, Julie's remarkable. She's she's tough. She's does not let down. She will work all day. And I don't know which, I think she's, if there's a fairy god, if that's real, fairy god, mother, fairy angel, she's it. Oh. She just is. But nobody ever really said that there's a menu on, on the mood of a person, you know? And um, I think the age and the life that I've lived just gives me this deep love for her in a way that I don't think I would have had 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, she and I have been together 27 years now. So she's something quite remarkable, quite deep about her. And uh, it's it's only that I'm older and I've been able to put this all, all this wonderful stuff into one splendid cheesecake with a little zest. Uh, and a little cherry on top. Yeah, quite a life that you've built. And so is there some sort of referenceable or... Um, kind of something you think about when you think of a quote that you like to live by? Oh, uh, God, there's a whole book of, you know, it's, it's a lot of, I love a lot of uh, Mark Twain and Will, Will Rogers and, and even Da Vinci said some nice things, you know. I remember one off, offhand, I was looking at a, a picture I have here over my desk of fishing. I love I haven't been able to fly fish for many years, but fly, I love that. And it's, he said that you just put your hand into flowing river and you can feel the, the past, the, the present and the future run through your fingers. That one has always, that's how I feel or what I'm trying to describe to you is that is what you come to at some point in your life. Yeah. That's beautiful. And yeah. is there, I, this is like me selfishly asking because um, I realize 50 is young, but it's also in some pers from some perspective, you know, going into middle age and you just, you look and 
your energy, your vibe is so vibrant. And I'm curious, like how you eat, like, do you have a certain diet or a regimen around um, how you take care of your body? I think instinctively I've had that. I've seen other people, relatives when I was a kid, who just kind of ate a lot of stuff. Yeah. And, uh, it was all to occur to me, a lot of canned food is not the best thing for you. I mean, when I was a kid, it was a whole different world as far as vegetables. And I didn't get many really fresh vegetables <clears throat> until I left, <clears throat> excuse me, until I left Detroit and moved out to California and found all those wonderful fresh vegetables and and the great wine that was available. You know, it was just an entirely different world for me. I was 21, 22 when I went to UCLA. I went into the service right out of uh, high school in Detroit for four years. Then. I had a yeah. job bill and I couldn't help it. Somehow <laughs> I managed to get into college and UCLA yeah. is where I went. I, I, want, I want to hear more about it. I have one last question. Um, do you prefer, if you're going to go on vacation, do you prefer to be in the mountains or near the ocean? Oh, God. The, both, both of them. No, uh, he, that's a tough the one. Energy, you know, there are mountains, right? We have mountains. Look out here. We've got mountains on the other side of the lake. And over there, we've got the Olympic Peninsula, which is just surrounded by water. Yeah, um, we're lucky so, in Seattle. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's all creative input, and I don't think the people who live here understand that necessarily. They take it for granted. But I think the creative process is not something to take for granted. It's what we grow from, you know. It's what we become, and I've bundled enough, rumbled and grumbled enough in my lifetime to know what I'm talking about. Yes. I'm still alive, <laughs> you know. I'm still. Thriving. And I know yeah, I was about to say, you're not just alive, you're thriving. Yeah. So tell me, a, a guy from Detroit, Michigan, um, I've never been to Detroit, and it sounds like there were some canned foods, but what else? Tell me about your upbringing and your your, <laughs> your family. Well, that was World War II. You know, I was, I was a little kid. I remember the opening the cans. I'm oh, so, yeah. That's your question. Well, our generation was like TV dinners. We loved those TV yeah, dinners. Yeah, I ran into that too. Oh, yeah, the best. It's funny, I was just writing about that this morning uh, in, in the memoir, how um, born in the Depression with the parents' depression, they had lost, my dad had a successful business that he lost in depression. They lost a daughter and then a stillborn. And I was somehow, and I was, got all through of this and the depression ended right off the bat. World War II unfolded. My oldest brother was 12 years older and another older brother, six years older. But the older one became a P-51 pilot in World War II. And I, all of that stuff, just writing about it, where I stir up about specific things that really um, stay with me with purpose rather than judgmental. Uh, my dad was basically a 17-year-old when he went into the service to fight in World War One, And he drove an ambulance over in the war zone in France and had to pick up bodies and all of that stuff that would certainly give him very deep post-traumatic stress, which I did not realize until later when I was teaching storytelling to PTS vets after Iraq and Afghanistan. Right. So all of that stuff just comes to the surface is how much that impacted me, the value of it. My mother, who, who really didn't want it, he, all the time she was talking about wanting to leave my day out, all this sort of stuff was, I was surrounded by that in two wonderful big brothers one the oldest probably would be a trump follower the other one was quite the extreme and they would they finally had political arguments over the phone that i would be listening to and i'm thinking wow i've got both sides here and it's like putting in ingredients in a soup you know a stew you know it's just some of the stuff just doesn't work and my older brother's stuff did not quite work. It was blunted by something in their arguments. But at the end, they never talked to each other. And they both. Oh, they no. Were, yeah. I, I don't like those stories when I hear them about families that get separated by, you know, viewpoints. Or oftentimes you hear it's over money. Right? But it's just like blood runs thick. Like I never understand families that sever ties. 
I'm I, yeah, I'm sorry to I, hear that. I, you know, I, I now feel rewarded by it in an odd way because I've been able to reflect upon it in a way remembering my mom, which is why I probably really love women so much. Is she just stuck in there and had diabetes and was under, uh, uh, and didn't give her enough medical prescription. So she died, she died in the early sixties. And uh, I was not able to go back there. I couldn't afford to fly back for that. When I was going to UCLA and married too young because I, uh, I did not want to go to UCLA alone. I would say dating a girl and she wanted to marry rather than go. Yeah. Was, at that time where you, you didn't live with, with a woman. unless you Yeah. You, you had to put a ring on it for <laughs> sure. Yeah. Did you, did you have a sense when you were a kid, let's talk maybe fifth grade, middle school age of what you wanted to be or who were you looking to as kind of who, you, who were your heroes? I don't know why Orson Welles slips up there, but they, uh, but that's that's early time in the, uh, that you're talking about. Probably football, you know, I, I, I'm baseball. I love, uh, I was a baseball player and football player. And I think I could not, I couldn't get to all the, the Tiger baseball games I wanted to get to on a streetcar that I would have to take it. All that stuff. And I remember all this, this cleaning seats and all that so I can get in for nothing. <laughs> all those things were favorites of mine. I think sports was all I was exposed to. And I have to include my brother, Jim, who was six years old, older than I was. But he, when he had to babysit me, if you don't mind my going on, just a little bit about this one, because this is key to it, I realized in writing the memoir. Jim... Um, was a very sensitive guy. Dick was the older tough guy. And when Jim babysat me, when, oh, uh, when my folks would go out and he was, he would, he would get bored. So he'd play some music he wanted to play. Well, now this wasn't just ordinary music this guy played. I, I, didn't, I didn't know that, that I was listening to Charlie Parker, Billy Holiday, and Bud Powell, and all of a sudden Puccini and, uh, Stravinsky and he would just play these things because that's what he was in the mood for and then I had to share this one vision that he gave me one time listening to Ravel's Bolero I believe or Stravinsky's Rites of Spring whatever it was stuff I did not understand until he looked at he turned the light off in a two family flat and there was a street light out the side that just Flow came like a fan across the ceiling. And he says, look at that, Tom. And I looked up and there were some leaves, autumn leaves blowing through it and the winds kind of bopping them up and moving them on. And he says, that's life. Hmm. It's all rhythm. And I looked at it differently and I connected it, the visualness with the you know, all this stuff. And it all worked. It was perfect. It all worked, but I found that's what misses in some movies. This is this, this you can take certain film, movies that were made by a very one, very linear filmmaker who doesn't quite get that this great film of music guy over here has written this one music he's doing his work this guy's doing his work and to put them together like Robert Altman who's my yeah. band he's the guy I mentored with when I almost out of college he was a TV director he gave me all this stuff that just was fortifying what I felt with my yeah. brother that gave me all this stuff that yeah Feels like a for it feels like a different type of flow where it just kind of works. Yeah, it that makes sense. Make all of that stuff and the sensibility I had about my mother, I felt it's three other guys, older guys, four of us, men. And we would 
piddle around the way men do, but she was doing the dishes, doing the laundry, doing all the stuff the way women do. They do what needs to be done. And I couldn't stand that. I had to do washing. I started washing for dishes for her, I, whatever I could do to make, give her a moment. Of, yeah. To give, make her life a little bit easier. Yeah. Did you have um, teachers or I guess I'm always curious about people's self-esteem as a child. Like every now and then you hear these stories of, you know, parents who believed in people and that influenced them or a teacher who said like, you can do anything. Did you have anybody that stands out for you in your childhood that told you you could be, you know, Tom Skerritt, the, the one that we're meeting today? Oh no, I think that's going right to that creative stuff that we had in kindergarten when the imagination first emerges and sets it apart from other animals, um, <clears throat> how they cogitally, how they would direct me, how they would confirm this awful thing that I made that they suggested by moving it a little bit. And my looking at the not miracle that this person put in front of me. And, and I thought, well, gee, that's not mine anymore. That's yours. And I would say, no, I could not have come to this if you hadn't done what you just did. That made me relax. And I, I, I would never know this if I hadn't started writing the memoir. But those little tiny things, they're all seeds. They all lead us to other worse things or better things. It's us that we have to make our own, not decision, but a road to follow, given something that was abstract by someone you well, wish you could remember, a kindergarten teacher who gave yeah. me, not right or wrong or bad or good, but guided me and gave me a sense of self-confidence for the first time. And we know by research that if you have these programs at that time, these creative programs that you improve in difficult classes. And it has to do with that, with that self-confidence. All of this is what these teachers and school executives apparently understood without ever being able to verbalize it. It's right. how you feel. And different today. I mean, things have changed so much. They all came out of a hardship and, and, and some from World War I and, and the connection up to the Depression and into winning a war, World War II. But what you get out of the ups and downs is ultimately the strength of survival. Yeah. And that's what I'm talking about. How do we find that? We've already had these moments and we have to look back on all of it and not say this was worse than others. It's all the same. It's all the same playing field. It's how yeah, we it's go, all connected, how far yeah. we kick the ball. And so what made you decide to join the Air Force? Was that just kind of a, what people did then? Or was that something that was expected of you or a choice? Well, I, I knew I had to get away from Detroit and I don't know why. Um, but I think part of it was my dad was, bless his heart. He would always say that if you don't listen to me, you'll never amount to anything. A lot. That stayed with me. It bothered me because he was often angry and I was afraid of him and all that. All that kind of stuff just led up to me. I got to go. He's saying you become a carpenter part. Uh, uh, a plumber, fine. I have nothing against that. It's a really a great trade. I tried it. I did not see longevity in them though. And I think creative and creativity is longevity. It's eternal. And I just somehow or another went off to California where I had been when I was in the service for a while. So you went, you went to UCLA um and studied English. And how did you make that choice? Like there's all these schools, you can go pretty much anywhere. UCLA, by the way, is near impossible to get into today. So I'm guessing you had good grades? No, it was at a time 
uh, in the early 60s when you could get in if you were a resident of the state. And I, I came to the, I went to junior Santa Monica City College for a oh, year yeah. and then become a resident. At which point I was able to go there for $150 a year. Oh my gosh. And it was not overcrowded. I mean, you studied English, I'm guessing, because you were interested in words and telling stories. But yeah. how did you realize, or what was your first moment when you had an awareness that you could actually make money at it? That never occurred to me. <laughs> I could always make money. I could always survive. I knew I was going to be okay from when I was a kid. I always could, was concerned more about other people, my kids, my situation. All that stuff was much more important to me than celebrity. But I knew I had to be creative. I did not want to have somebody telling me what I should or should not do. Uh, I was never very good at shoulds or should nots. Yeah. So I had to learn on my own, which I knew I had to learn. And I still have the gift of the wonderment of what's new. And how, how can I open that up? How can I reveal what's new? And how does that work? Mm -hmm. um, and so if you have to look back, though, and say, like, this was my moment when I had kind of a break, what would that be? Your first kind of big break? I had done a little bit of acting in Detroit at uh, Wayne State University when I was gone, and I, it freed me. And um, that was it. I never thought of being it, but I went to California. I, was, I went to this see Citizen Kane, and I said, I'm going to write and direct to that level. But I knew instinctively that you have to feel what art is. To judge art, bad or good, is not the point. It either works for you or it doesn't work for you. It's open and shut from my, from my standpoint. It's like the Mona Lisa with that little curve. That little yeah. Smile. Oh, yeah. No, you, it is like you feel it or you don't. So it sounds like in your, um, you're thinking like the seeds and they all kind of build on each other and there's no real big break. So let me ask it maybe a little bit differently. When was the first time someone random recognized you from seeing you in something? Oh, that. I don't know. I never thought about that. I didn't. Well, because you don't like the celebrity part, but that part, if you don't like it, must have had its own kind of, not PTSD, but creates anxiety if you don't want it. Um, I don't think there's anything I didn't want. Uh, there was, there were, I would put it in a class at well, that's fine. I really appreciate you saying, make complimenting me. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. I'm moving on. But to dwell on how it starts was kind of the pieces I was trying to put together with Bob Altman, how that came about, how I became an actor. I thought, well, if you're going to be an actor, you got to know what it feels like. So mm -hmm. I thought I'm going to have to do some theater because I'm also shy and self-conscious. I could never, years ago, I could never have a conversation like this. But I'm open and frank about all this at time. Too, too old to mess around with it. So I did some theater, and uh, I get great compliments from people. And I get some two guys said, hey, we'd like to do a little Dollar 98 movie. And uh, I was in the last semester at UCLA, and I dropped out to do this little film. And I thought, it's better I go into this and be rather than having a teacher teaching art, I wanted to see the artists doing the work. So here I am within this movie with three or four other actors. One is Robert Redford, another is Sidney Pollack. Oh they, that's where they built their, a relationship. And Bob and I became good friends through the 60s and into the 70s, but distance and careers and all that make a distance, an enormous distance over a period of years. And... Uh, it, it just, and then this guy saw some, that film, I think, and TV director lived in the neighborhood. He says, come on, um, I worked in a few films that he was doing, but I also mentored with him. Now, there was a very interesting guy, and I could learn more than just being an actor. 
guy, the TV director that I was learning all this stuff from, his his moans, his groans, his highs, his lows, was Robert Altman. So he calls one day and he says, I'm doing this movie. I'd like you to be in it. So I said, sure. So I'm in the middle of this movie and he's telling me that the studio hates it and all this stuff and they're going to fire him. And I'm thinking, man, I felt something about that movie that this is going to be a, an extraordinary movie that nobody seems in this room seems to understand. But the cast and crew were loving the time they spent with Robert Altman. That was key to it. Because invention comes out. Of it. Even the worst, as he pointed out, the worst suggestions can lead you to your your what you your 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 goal. And you would not have gotten there if this bad suggestion um, had come along, had not come along. You know? It just so there is that's where the bad and good just it all comes together. One thing gives you another. And if you are open, and I fortunately I was open most of my life to all this stuff is, and I'm still open to it. The joy of that and the joy of this film mash being studio does not want to release it. And somehow he manages to get all these great reviews of the film. It becomes one of the 25 great films of the 20th century. And all of this was the guy that was teaching me that. And then right after that, during the opening of that, I met a guy named Hal Ashby. A uh, dear friend, Bo Bridges, introduced us. And, and I think that Hal is just neat. And we just, I just love being with that guy. So he's Academy Award winning editor, turning director. I'm watching him. He's teaching me and all the laughter and the sounds of the music he had playing, which was really good music in those days because we had really good music playing in those days. So that's my beginning of really wanting to be a director. Yeah. With the best. Hal Ashby did Hilton Maughan being there and some other wonderful films while he was still alive. And uh, I just one thing after another, tell uh, uh, a turning point, uh, which was a wonderful film. I don't know if you're familiar with how turning point but it was on yeah. the of LA and, all of these things I'm learning from these remarkable people I'm spending time with. I mean, I can't with. even believe the names that you're throwing out there. I mean, it's the the elite of the elite. Either. I just still can't believe all this stuff, you know? That yeah. I, except I was open for the best of them. Yeah. Are there any that stand out to you as far as the roles that you played where you felt like the freest or it just flowed? Like this, this is a no-brainer to play this character. God, there's a few of them. Certainly, uh, uh, MASH was. Uh, and little things like Hal Ashby was doing at Carol Moore. And he calls one day, he says, hey, this guy's playing the motorcycle. He got an accident, broke his leg. Would you come up and fill in? So I did. I did this cop thing. And it's not always the characters. It's the whole ambiance, the Hal. And, and the producer of the film and all these laughing all the time. Yeah. The silliness of it. So uh, one role or another uh, just largely is the appreciation of having all of this in my lifetime. Certainly in my favorite movie of all of them that moved me the deepest is the River Runs Through It. And- uh, That movie is intense. Yeah, but I, I've seen it. I don't usually, I don't see all the films I make, but that one moved me enough that I've seen it on several occasions. And every time it takes me to a deeper layer. And that's, I think, largely because of who I am. I see the layers in life. I can't necessarily express them any other way other than to write or act. Right. Are there roles that you've been offered that you passed up that you're that you that turned into great movies that you're like, oh, that was a mistake or the other way around? Um, well, I guess that would be the question. <laughs> you can't really say the roles I, that you I, took I, that no, you regret. I, I don't see it, anything as a mistake. It's all part of the same connection. Yes, it is. I had um, 
signed to do a movie with uh, Alan Burstyn in Canada. So everything was great. I signed. I came home. A few days later, Bob, uh, Bob Redford called and said, hey, would you come and do um, uh, something people, uh, the one that won the Academy Award that year. Ordinary, ordinary, ordinary people. people. Yeah. yeah. And when we played a Donald Kelly, uh, Donald uh, uh, Sutherland, Sutherland role. And um, I said, God, I just signed this thing up there in Canada. I feel obligated to do that. So that was that. Uh, the other one, the, the one in Canada was very poorly directed, didn't have a hope. And uh, 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 the ordinary people won for Academy Awards, you know. So, but that's a conversation, by the way. I don't see this as, uh, by God, I should have done that. I, right. I, I, you know, I just didn't. I didn't yeah. take the right. That's a skill. I think that might be your superpower. The way that you look at the world is is unique. A lot of people live in the past or in the future, and you seem to live very much in the present. I've been through some difficult times with the paranoid schizophrenia and going home and dealing with a number of years. I didn't know whether she would be sane or not. And the kids, I couldn't afford anybody to watch the kids. And if I got some, anyway, I won't go on about that, but it caused uh, a level of post-traumatic stress, which I now value because I understand what it is. And I see that if you can channel that, all that self-loathing and discontent with yourself into a creative avenue, like <clears throat> discipline of writing or painting, which i had done too, and carving in wood, all of this ex 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 exhibiting yourself from everything you've experienced and yeah. finding that everything I'm doing is pretty damn good. And when I direct, I'm really good at that because it's the visual, it's the cinematography, it's the language, and it's the performance. And I understand all of that. Yeah, how they all connect. But it doesn't work in the business. You're either an actor and you're a director or whatever. <clears throat> but... Um, I don't know like if that's there's a lot of for your question. No, it is. I mean, I, you know, I'm hearing a theme for sure. And that's why, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask, you've got, you know, more than staying power, you've got a true, you know, long, long, incredible career in an industry that, um, you know, can be fickle and can be challenging. Um, and so is there something that you would say, gives you that staying power or you're seeing there's others who have it. Is there a common thread among those who uh, continue to get pursued for roles, but also have the, the grit and the perseverance and the right kind of DNA for it? I don't know. I don't know those answers. All I know is that I'm still trying to learn and I watch other actors perform when I first saw that movie. Oh, it was in that first movie with yeah. Richard and, and Sidney Pollack. I watched oh, that's incredible. Work. So I learned from watching those two guys work. So it's <clears throat> it's learning from others and uh, never really stealing anything particularly from them. It's just the overall, they had a bad day today, or I yeah. had a bad day. And so, you know, and I collectively put it together and here, here we are having a conversation about what? Yeah. The whole thing. Interesting. This is the whole loaf here. And when you're, when you're assessing opportunities, uh, through which lens are you looking at these opportunities? Like how do you vet um, different roles or diff just different opportunities in business? Staying with acting was always something I, I, I felt right out of college. I really felt that we have a responsibility to do the best work we possibly can because this is in, the most influential of all media. And I held on to that one. So a lot of stuff I had to make was not particularly pleasing, but it paid the money to pay the rent, take care of feeding my children. So I was able to 
this is what I see. Some of the stuff I I wouldn't want to see or I've made a living doing. Hey, man, you were still taking it in, the whole thing. And you were still able to feed your kids. So it was an extraordinary situation that was out of your control and you tried to control it. You did the best you could. And all I can say is that I've tried to do the best I could at any given time. And sometimes I played roles I was uh, uh, just a lemon in because I just wasn't in the right environment. And I wasn't playing the right character. So we won't discuss that part of it. But also, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, it just feeds the better stuff that you can do. And right. that's always in theater. Though. Stay yes. the real acting. Because it's film, it's, you know, you stop and go. When I first got you on the phone and we first started talking about your superpower and you deflected and, and talked about Julie and how incredible she is, which um, I'm guessing she's going to listen. So that'll be good. <laughs> um, I'm just curious how you guys met. I know you met when she was an executive at Fox and you were doing picket fences is what I read. Yes. And so what, I guess, drew you to her initially and what drew her to you? Well, I don't know about her to me, but I know that I was uh, Pete. <clears throat> Peter, Peter, Peter Roth was running that, the head of the television for 20th Century Fox, and she was the one that took care of things. And uh, I would, we'd go to lunch periodic and come by and wait, sitting down and wait, and she would say, he'll be out when he's got a, he's on the phone message, right, and he's got some stuff to do. He'll be out. She was always letting me know. And of course, she's un, uh, quite attractive. I'm single, and uh, and she's quite interesting. And the way she dealt with her subordinates, the way she would say, I, "We need to have this by three o'clock. You're going to take care of it, right? You know, and get it there." She would just look at them, and she gives you that unyielding, piercing eye. And you respond, but she does it with a little twinkle. And yeah. Like, yeah. Like uh, the great painting, Mona Lisa. And I see her sometimes that way. And um, what's your story? You know, it's a, what is this? Still 27 years later. That's but, amazing. Anyway, Did you ask her out right away? No, I didn't. I just thought she was interesting. One day we're at lunch with Peter and I said, so... About Julie, he says, oh, God, if I, if he goes, I couldn't find the words to praise her. Uh. And um, so I, I asked her to go to, uh, I was nominated for something, Golden Globes. And I asked her if she would uh, uh, go with me. And she did. And um she holds her own, always, still, and I uh, just started seeing her a little bit more. Yeah, and and many years later, what a, how incredible great. to be this happy this many years in. It's always, men and women, there's always going to be a conflict. There's got to be that conflict. It's understanding one another's language as much as anything. Women can get to the point a lot quicker than men can. As you notice, you're getting me just echoing it, <laughs> going on in my head, you know. And uh, women can just say, uh, enough time to just take the garbage out. <laughs> We're more net net, I guess. Yeah, and bottom, gets, bottom line, it, yeah. Yeah, you know, and bottom line, you got, we, every day we're dealing with stuff, you know. And by the way, I guess I may have to take the garbage out now that I mentioned it. <laughs> You're like, oh yeah, it is. It's uh, Wednesday. Yeah. It's Wednesday. Yeah. It's garbage day. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's that's so funny. Well, good. That subconsciously came out. You remembered, so that's good. Well, so that's really important. To <laughs> tell me about your memoir. When's that gonna? Is this like a secret? When is this coming out? Uh you know, it's really been very difficult because I'm, I'm writing a very funny uh, movie. And I have uh, another one, another one that I've been writing. I, the thesis on imagination I put aside. But the, uh, 
I don't have a response to that. Yeah. Well, so the the screenplay, the movie that you're writing, what's that about? Can I go on a little bit? Of course. I'll tell you all. There's a guy in the neighborhood several years, many years ago, told you a story about he had a friend over for dinner who he hadn't seen since they were kids. Afterwards, they talked about chess. And uh, said, gee, we always played when we were kids. I'm going to see if I still have that old chess set. So we pull it out, and a couple of pieces are missing. And he says, I, I, then I said, okay, we can't play chess, but I've always wanted to get a custom-made chess set, with exotic wood and all that sort of stuff. And I can afford that. Got a guy in Alabama who made this chess set for him. And he, he gets this thing weeks later in the mail, and it's not his set. It's some other guy said that. And he says, oh, I'm sorry. Your set was sent to some guy in New Jersey and you got his by mistake, far inferior. <clears throat> so he tried, he tells the guy, well, you got to make an exchange. And he says, well, I don't think that's a good idea because the guy in New Jersey, he kind of likes it. Certainly he ain't going to give it back. And had his name on the, on the label. His name yeah. was on that. So he claimed it. And I said, well, what'd you do? He said, oh, I just told the guy he owes me a chess set, and that was it. Nothing. It stayed with me, though. What if I was just going to be going back to see my son? I went to NYU, and next week he's got a week off. I was going to go back and visit him. So, okay, I take the set with me, and I fly back, <clears throat> find my son, and uh, I somehow not managed to get in touch with these guys. Uh, how do I do it? Do I get to this particular guy? And everybody just said, over there in New Jersey, when I go to try to find out, or anybody might know that name. Every time I say, I ask for his name, who is this guy? I get this look. Who's asking? I was getting a lot of that. Yeah. So, Maybe it's not a good idea, but I'm because I am who I am. I'm curious enough to see what this might be. I wind up in this guy's house who had put a false name on one of his mm. people. And it turns out he runs a franchise of funeral parties. Oh my gosh. Which his ex wife, who's now dead. It was her family, so he married her. He owns this five or six funeral homes. And um, he's got the guys in there. Ralphie is his nephew, who is his right-hand guy. He slaps around like he's his son. And yeah. it's this thing. He's suddenly there with this guy. He says, you were the guy from out there where they got the fish and the trees and all that sort of stuff. And... Uh, you want to come here and take this set that belongs to me? And he's, anyway, goes through a putting him down. But he finally says, but you got balls, man. So you come all the way back, all the way across the country here, the wagon train and something like that. Come back here to try to get my set that's sitting in. But you got balls. I'm going to give, I'm going to give you a break here. I'll tell you what. Play, uh, Three games, two out of three, I'll think about it. Mm -hmm. But he's so curious, and I would be too. I want to play this out. And it's this thing that takes place over the next few days, which is very complicated. But he's so proud he's got these drive-in. Every time I, my character wants to make a move, um, Interrupts with these stupid stories about some guy I remember when I was a kid throwing the tomatoes and this guy's walking along. He always walks like this, got a brush it brown I had on his uh, dog shit that I should say. I got a hat on his head and he's getting his lunch pail and he's always kind of walking like this. He's, and I'm trying to concentrate. And he yeah. does this all the time. He comes up to these stories after he makes a terrible move. And I so see funny. this is interesting, so I'm going to kind of stay in here. Plus, he's got his guys, Dimitri, who teaches him, keeps him, 
gives him a hand signal, which which moves to me, all this stuff. Anyway, it goes on over. I won't go any further because you got to see the movie. I want, I can't wait to see it. You have a lot going on. How are you balancing all that with, I mean, I know you and Julie started Triple Squirrels together. Um, super curious how you guys came up with the name. Well, uh, let me tell you how I came up with the name, but first I want to tell you about the company because I could see back in the 90s that Hollywood executives were leaning towards whatever films make a lot of money. So to figure out how much more they could cut by doing yes, of course. Way. But me, I had this corny old thing about this is the most influential of all. Which is, when I go from UCLA, this is the most influential of all media. We got to do the best we possibly can. It's telling good stories. So I felt unless if you don't consider the viewers. And you're more concerned about how much more money we can, you're going to be in trouble. Right. So they got into making these the rubber stamp films of, uh, you know, uh, special effects and then scare the hell out of people and bad guys shooting at people, which I felt influences a lot of little kids in high school. Get, yeah. Get dad's gun and go shoot people. It's like target practice for them psychologically. And fun. They get to shoot these guns and somebody falls. Right. It's small stuff. We got to remember this. So uh, it, it's that kind of thing of, of, uh, of how I came to the business was I realized that Hollywood was going to be in trouble. I don't know when. Right. The tank. Because then he got rubber stamping too much. The same stories. Special effects were not new. They were just remodified. And I started six years ago with trying to put something together where we could make our own stuff for not much money and distribute it. I didn't know how we were going to have for revenue at that point. It was a few years ago. Things have changed immensely now. But yeah, Triple Squirrels came as a result of uh, two years ago of um, we just conversa- having a conversation with our, uh, one of our uh, officials officers uh, uh, saying, well, I, my background was Galway B as far as I know. And that was uh, on my coat of arms. They had took three squirrels on it. And in Latin, it's underneath, it says first and last in battle. And we, I, I'm talking, I said, oh, what about triple squirrels? It's, rem- but, it's definitely memorable, like stands out. Interesting. So it's a result of trying to make more authentic kind of for the audience, meaningful films, as opposed to trying to do the whole Hollywood blockbuster. Never mind that. It's a lot of money. And that they put into that. We can make money. And I've always felt we don't need that all. You guys are expanding on the budget because you all can make a little more cut out of it. That didn't work for me somehow. I just didn't sit right. And, and I understand their point of view. They all get together and have a cup of tea and uh, <clears throat> conversations. And one's a favorite, making more money is not a bad thing to talk about. Um, but I just felt the morality was to tell the good stories well and you didn't have to spend a lot of money. So that came to a point where what we're doing is collecting a lot of short films that have not had exhibition in one way or another, have not Mm -hmm. been seen, uh, that are available on shelves, or films that have been on PPS, are very interesting films that have played and are uh, owned by, in this case, someone, a woman we know, who uh, the film was called Great Film uh, Female Band, Girls, Girls in the Band about girls back in the 50s and these great bands. Point is, I'm getting at, was that everything had to be uplifting. No sad, tragic stuff about poor me or a boy, it's too bad, I'm going to die, and all this sort of stuff. No, and not in and COVID or any time. Uplifting good stories about Dale Shahudi, a glass banker in his first days. Documenting on that. Great fishing rivers from Idaho to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, chefs in the woods that we find out here. Number one pizza maker, uh, because of the dough crust, particular crust, 
is it a guy, a little sh- uh, place, at, uh, a little shop by the ferry landing up in uh, Kingston. So these are all Pacific Northwest stories? These are all Pacific. But those ones, those are, we have a little bit of money. Those we're shooting ourselves. So we have ownership. The rest of these we lease for two years. And it's ad-based, which is okay. the point I'm getting. So that's at. that's the business model. That's how the so company split makes money. 50 on, on the advertising. So it takes a couple of years to even get anybody to notice we're even on all the streaming channels going on. Yeah. A lot of dumpy stuff. All sorts of stuff going. And so what I are the, just, what are the growth it, plans for that um, that you and Julie have for the business? Well, the growth plan begins with, first of all, uh, we are able to get on Stir App, which is owned by Sinclair Broadcasting. And uh, we have a channel, we name the channel an, uh, Evergreen, E-V-R-G-R-N, cutting the vowels out. Mm. And um, so we have the Evergreen channel on stir app and now we've expanded to i think seven or eight other platforms with whom we share and then we share the advertising that they're getting on these seven or eight different platforms around the country and yeah us more up up to possibly 10 million people viewing so it's this Amazing. gradual growth that we have to get into we don't just jump into it because we can expand make a lot of money we will make the money and we'll have established of company that's really in its in and of itself has value for someone else to come along and buy it. Definitely. And is there, um, I guess, a measure people look at data so much now to tell stories through technology uh, stories, not, not storytelling, but to tell the story of the business, what types of metrics, <clears throat> if any, are you guys using to measure the success of the business? Honestly, I don't know. I'm a creative in this. Uh, well, I saw that. I'm like, you're the chief creative officer, and I'm not cr- a creative person. So I'm curious what that, what you do as far as your job relative to what Julie's job is. She's a CEO, and I yeah. just stay out of the way. <laughs> she knows all of this stuff. She just, she just knows she's my fairy godmother. I don't know, you know, how else to describe her. Very quiet. Yeah. Very straightforward. I can't get her to laugh sometimes. But the chief but, creative officer, as far as your role, you're getting behind and discovering and kind of driving some of the projects? Oh, yeah. I mean, particularly the ones we're making. Um, yeah. She agrees with my creative silliness in some case. But... Um, yeah. <laughs> Like I have to blame Altman and Ashby and a few other guys, you know, along the way that have made some wonderful films. Yeah. A lot of fun and absurd. I love absurdity, but that's, you got to get your smarts around that. This is going on too long kind of thing. And you, yeah. And then you realize you should cut here, you keep it going and you get real laughter then. Yes. Well, you sound that you guys sound like you're a great pair and I'm excited to continue yeah. to watch the success and, and watch some of your films. Um, yeah. yeah. And getting prepared for the podcast. I got really excited. I give myself a whole list of things I want to, I want to check out and your website's awesome. It, I mean, I don't know what role you played in that, but it's very good, cool, creative vibes. It's really cool. If I you loved it. In touch with Julie, she could give you all the platforms it's on right now. I, yeah. I can't tell them I can't. Yeah, I'll have to ask her too. Well, you're the creative. You don't have to worry about that. Just like you get out of her way. You got to know your lane. And it sounds like you do. So tell me about your weekends when you're not working. What's your idea of kind of the perfect weekend um, by yourself? If you were just by yourself and you were given 48 hours, what would you want to do? Walk in the woods. I want to... Uh, which I do. My daughter lives on Vashon Island and uh, with her children. And she just, she just turned, made me a great, great grandpa. And uh, uh, she's got, she lives in the woods on Vashon Island. And when I go over there, I like to walk, walk the paths. I just like to feel the smell, the air. I just love the rhythms of nature. Yeah. I love it. And what do you do? We talked a little bit about kind of eating and wellness and not eating, you know, eating like fresh vegetables and stuff. 
what do you do physically and um, for your body? And what do you do for your mental health? We've come out of this pandemic and I think we're only gonna start to see what impact that's had. Um, do you create space for your mental health? I'm working on that because I'm at an age where I forget, you know, uh, words and names of people. And um, I have to keep it working as much as I possibly can. And uh, a lot of this is everything we're talking about now. And uh, I don't think I could talk about this if I didn't really work on it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's just... Uh, a walk and pushing myself and Julie's forever saying, never mind that you don't have a parachute. You have one somewhere. I'll grab you and pitch it. I'll pick you up before you hit the ground if that's your concern. But she does push me in the right direction. And I yeah. just sometimes as the, the ego comes up, I said, leave me alone. You know, I don't <laughs> say that, but I feel just give me a break between all the stuff you're telling me, showing me what to do, these brain games that she can't, I, I should be getting. I think it's important. I mean, I'm only 50 and I already sense, you know, forgetting certain things or losing the word I'm looking for. And then I can't speak as quickly as my brain is working. Like I can't access the word that I'm looking oh, for. So yeah, I need to be doing it too. I've been doing some like word games and I think there's something to all of that. So I think, yeah, we should all listen to Julie. She should send me what to do also. <laughs> she will remember everything, every finger that you pointed, left hand, right hand. She's remarkable. She's yeah. really remarkable. And, and uh, I don't really have, uh, as men do, the ego that I once had. As a kid, as, as an athlete, and all that stuff that uh, is in the business that I'm in, and a lot of ego. Yeah. It well, you're also, I mean, maybe Julie will be upset with me for saying this, but you're ridiculously handsome. That comes with some ego too. Like they don't, they don't make me, you look like a, a, um, like fake, almost like too handsome. It's unbelievable to me. And you still look so good. It's crazy. Like that head of hair. <laughs> you look great. You're blushing. You look, say that. You look great. Tell, tell Julie. I look in the mirror when I'm brushing my hair this morning, I said, Man, you look, you're getting to look old. No, <laughs> I you, said, well, you okay. look great. that's the way it is. We all live and die. Yeah. That's it's the open just, and shut of it. We can't know? slow down time. Yeah. Okay. So my final question for you, and thank you again for being on the podcast, um, is what fuels you? What What's your ultimate fuel gets you out of bed in the morning? You can't say Julie, by the way. <laughs> just being alive. There's some mornings I get up and I just don't think I'm going to make it through the day, you know, and I just have to push myself and Julie will not allow it. And uh, I mean, for me, for me to behave that way, she'll kick me in the ass. Yeah. One way or another. And uh, <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Just I appreciate alive. that. That's the gratitude. They yeah. say, you know, that's a great answer because they do say that gratitude like that, just gratitude for being able to take another breath and walk another step um, is the true, if you can access that, it's the true way to access joy and happiness. It really is the truth of the matter right down the heart of it for all of us to have that sense of we don't live in Ukraine. We don't live in Russia. You know, we live here and we in this place, which has got the sun's out. It's got a gorgeous view of Mount Rainier in the distance. And the water's down there. And occasionally I see an otter come up. What the hell? 